Welcome back to part two of our end of year special edition of Talking Europe as we wrap up 2017. You may have noticed that we're not in our usual studios. Uh, you find us here in the historic Paris Observatory. Uh, we're underneath the cupola, in fact. Now, this institution was founded 350 years ago in 1667 as Europeans started trying to map the stars. Well, we're here today with someone who's got a little bit closer to those stars than most of us. I'm very pleased to meet Thomas Pesquet, France's 10th astronaut. Hello there. Hello. Just going to introduce you a bit better to our viewers. Yes. Uh, Thomas hails from Rouen in northern France. He trained as, uh, trained as an aeronautical engineer and pilot. And it was in 2009 that you started on your path to becoming an right. actual astronaut. So not that long ago, really. No. Uh, you speak five languages. All of them pretty bad. <laughs> we'll test that, maybe. And you spent a total of 196 days, 17 hours, 49 minutes on your mission, traveling 127 million kilometers in that time. Those are some hard. pretty big numbers. How does it feel to be the 10th French person in history to become an astronaut? Well, it feels pretty good. I mean, it felt hard at at times, obviously, because uh, there's a lot of work to be done, there's a lot of struggle to get there. Um, but, but it's fine, really, because it, it was my childhood dreams, and I could achieve it, which is, which is pretty unbelievable when, when it happens to you. Um, and yeah, there were some pretty big shoes to fill, because some, some people started to, Jean-Luc Chrétien is the first ever from Western Europe, and so on and so forth, so um, had some pressure on at some point. But, uh, but that's fine. It's, uh, it's also good to be the, the young one, the new kid on the block. I hope it lasts for a little bit longer. Yes, indeed. Uh, it, is it possible that you could go back into space at some point? I would certainly love to. Um, it doesn't only depend on me. I can, I can keep myself ready and can do as much as I want. Um, but uh, in the end, it's also going to be very political because it's, it's a cooperation program. All the countries are contributing uh, to, to different extents. So um, everybody's going to have to wait for their turn. You know, it's a European endeavor. So it's going to be Germany, Italy, France, and so on and so forth. So I don't know when, but I certainly hope so. Indeed, now we're, our program is Talking Europe, and uh, speaking of Europe, you work for the European Space Agency. Indeed. Of course, uh, the United States and Russia were the big giants that had the big space race. We've now got China, India, we've got all sorts of countries involved in space. What is Europe's place in space? Well, Europe is actually pretty big in the aerospace industry. Um, technologically, I think we're second only to the U.S. maybe, and in some areas we're actually much better uh, in science for science and exploration, which much less budget than NASA actually has. Uh, we're doing much more, uh, which is unheralded, and sometimes that's, that's just a shame. Um, in human spaceflight, we're, we're much smaller, but, but if you're asking me, it's actually fine because we get, we get access to this, this fantastic laboratory uh, that, quite frankly, NASA and the, the Russians have paid for to a large extent, um, and, but we still get access to it, so I think we have a pretty good deal. Um, so in the end, I think, I think we're doing pretty good. I mean, China is, is up and coming, and, and so is India, uh, but we're second only to the U.S., and like I said, in some areas, we're actually first. Okay, and perhaps the good value version of space exploration then, as yeah. you were saying. Now, your mission itself was extremely closely followed all around the world, particularly by people here in France, of course. Uh, we can give our viewers some insights into exactly what happened on that mission, how the experience was for you. We've got a little report that we've prepared. Blasting off from the icy plains of Kazakhstan, Thomas Pesky achieved his childhood dream of traveling to outer space. He quickly acclimatized to life as an extraterrestrial, taking zero gravity conditions in his stride. Pretty cool way to get around. During his 196 days aboard the International Space Station, Toma worked for over 40 hours a week on experiments in the Columbus Laboratory. This is where we take blood samples and do tests on ourselves. We study material sciences, fluid mechanics, and we also have a greenhouse to grow plants in microgravity. Here's the biology laboratory and the physiology section. There's everything we need. And here's my Air France plane. In January and March, Thomas lived the dream of all astronauts, spacewalking, changing a solar panel and fixing an ammonia leak. And he captured the moment with a selfie. Unlike previous generations of French astronauts, the 39-year-old is used to social media, and he was eager to share his experience with us Earthlings. 
including his daily routine, going to the canteen. We even have laughing cow cheese. We have everything we need in space. His personal cabin. This is where I sleep, attached to the wall. It's super comfortable sleeping without gravity. And other essentials. Here you go, our space toilet. Thomas celebrated his 39th birthday during his stay. But now his time in the station is over. What his many fans will most treasure are the hundreds of spectacular photos he took of the Earth. Well, there we go. Uh, Thomas, a uh, time in space, six months condensed into a very short report there. It looks like you had quite a lot of fun. Uh, there must have been some tough moments. What was your, your most difficult moment in space? Yeah, absolutely. There were some, some difficult moments. And one of them was when the toilets broke at the very oh, beginning dear. of this, uh, of this <laughs> stay, which was not easy. It took us almost two days uh, to recover. Uh, and that was not a good situation to be in, to be stuck in space with no toilets at all. Um, and some, at some other time during a, an extravehicular activity, a spacewalk, as we say, I thought I had lost my, my bag of tools, which was not a good feeling, I can tell you that, because not only um, is that a problem for the, the, for the task that you have to finish up, but it's also it can become a space debris, and, and after one orbit, it can come back and actually impact you with some, some relative velocity. So I was not too happy about it. It turns out I've just misplaced it by, uh, by this much, but uh, you know, for a second, my, my heart was racing. What a relief. Yeah, actually. <laughs> now, we know that you were pretty busy while you were up there, uh, and it seems that you've continued on somewhat of a, a personal mission as well as your official duties, now you're back down on Earth. A climate change has come into that a lot. You've become very involved in uh, educating about climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, what did being in space teach you about this issue? Well, it, it actually taught me a lot, and I, was, I, was, I thought I was uh, environmentally conscious when I left, which most of us are, really, in Europe. Um, but, but actually, seeing the Earth from the perspective of the Rolls orbit is a, is a different experience. And, and they call it the overview effect. And what it means, really, is that you take a step back and you can see some phenomena that happen at a global scale all across, the, all across continents, all across the globe. And we're not equipped for that on Earth. I mean, for me, as soon as the numbers become too big, what well, I can reason with them, I can do math, but you cannot really understand them, you cannot feel them. And, and when you see it for yourself, when you see air pollution, uh, sea pollution, um, bad, bad land use, bad land management, when you see the ice melting on the glaciers, well, you know, you see it for yourself. You don't have to be taught, you don't have to be explained, and that changes everything. And you see that the planet is very fragile, which is very hard to actually to comprehend when you're on the ground and it seems so big. And I know that you were recently involved in the COP23 uh, summit, uh, following up on the, the promises made uh, for the Paris Agreement at COP21. Uh, do you believe that our leaders here in Europe and beyond are doing enough? Well, you're never doing enough, if you're asking me. But, uh, but, but I see some good signs, because if only in the way that people reacted to those topics during the mission. Like you said, it was not part of the plan initially to talk so much about the environment, but I just had to uh, because I was, I was just like a witness um, and, and you have to act up and, and, and say something, which I did. And, and people reacted to it very positively and now I see it in Europe, I, I see it everywhere in the world. Uh, people have understood that we're in a bad situation, that there's a problem, that things need to be done, and now is the time to really get together and find the efficient solutions. In most of the cases, the technology already exists. We just have to adopt it massively and use it at a much larger scale. Now, uh, we've actually got a, a question relating to the environment that someone brought up on Twitter, uh, somebody called Red Squirrel. Uh, you mentioned space debris before. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, how big an issue is space debris? It seems that there is quite a lot of garbage floating up there uh, that we've put in space. Yeah, we, we did, actually, uh, and that's unfortunate. But, but the situation, I would say, is, is bad, that's true, but it's not as bad as people sometimes think because the debris are very small and they're few and far in between. Um, which doesn't make it any better, uh, but at least it enables us to still go to space. We can send missions there. We're not threatened by the debris. It's not like a cloud of debris, uh, you know, just around the Earth. So that's one good thing. And the other good thing is that now 
uh, we've equipped ourselves with uh, rules and regulations. We're not allowed to even produce some more space debris. We're very cautious to this, and we're working on the technology in the European Space Agency in some of the parts of the world and on board the ISS to one day launch a mission to clean up uh, the lower Earth orbit, and, that, and that's going to be something that's badly needed. While you were up there, apart from uh, looking for your tools and uh, trying to fix the toilet, you were also quite busy taking photos. I've got this magnificent book uh, that, of your photos that you took from space. Eventually took about 80,000. Yeah. Uh, did this really become a passion for you then? It, it, it did, as a matter of fact. Well, first of all, because there's not so much to, to do on the space station on Sundays when you're not working and you're resting. So my, my hobby was actually to take pictures. And the, and the view of the Earth is so magnificent that I felt I had to share that view with the, uh, all the people who were interested to follow me. Um, and in the end, yeah, I was pretty bad at the beginning, but I, I got better uh, <laughs> through 85,000 pictures. Uh, and in the end, there's a few ones that are actually pretty decent, and we collected them in that book. And I'm trying to show pictures of, of beautiful places, um, nature, uh, magnificent scenery, but also you know, some pretty bad things, pollution, uh, war in Syria, things like this that I try to capture to, to make people think. It's not only about look at how beautiful the earth is, it's also uh, look at what, the, what problems we have and what could you, what could we all do collectively to make it better. The profits from this book are actually going to uh, a charity that feeds homeless people and poor people here in France. Uh, another literary endeavor that you're involved in very personally is this fantastic comic strip book uh, called, uh, well, In the Suit of Thomas Pesquet, I think we can translate that as. Um, now, this uh, is quite the, the labor of love. Uh, the lady who made it has been working on it for quite some time with you. Very educational. You're wanting to educate people about what you've done. Yeah, absolutely. I want to, so so we're, my, my point of view, and I think it's being shared by lots of people at the agency, is that we're going to space, we're flying into space um, for the people on the ground. Uh, to make their life better somehow, uh, to change things. So um, I wanted to share that, ex that experience and to share it with everybody, not, not just with the people that are passionate about space and technology, but also with, with kids, um, with older people, with anybody, really. I think that space is a dream potential, potential dream that's actually unbelievable. We, you, see, you see books, you see films, Hollywood movies about space. And uh, I thought a comic book well, actually, a good way to, well, to make people laugh because there's a lot of funny scenes and funny, funny moments, but also to make them think, to teach them something. And so there's a lot of information in there, 250 pages. She did a wonderful job. It's really well documented. And uh, your job's engineer, astronaut, still very much a male preserve uh, sure. most of the time. Several of my friends have told me that their daughters are enormous fans of yours and have been inspired by you. Uh, do you feel that you might potentially inspire a new generation of female engineers, add some more female astronauts to the list. That would be lovely, actually, because uh, I've, I've always felt like there was no good reason uh, for which we don't have 50% you know, women. Uh, but actually, 15% uh, of the people who sign up for the selection are women. Uh, so we, we, we picked one out of six, which is also exactly 15%. Could have been more, obviously, but that, that's, you kind of say that it's really bad. We, we, did it, we did what we could. Next time, I hope we get 50% mm. ladies who sign up at 50% get selected. You know, actually one of the, the best, I've, I've received a lot of, of, of mail, emails from people. One of the best I've ever received was from a, a dad. He said, well, I want to thank you because thanks to you, my daughter doesn't want to be you she wants to be Peggy Whitson, because <laughs> Peggy Whitson was actually the commander of the space station, so kind of higher ranked. And, and that young girl thought that was fantastic that uh, you know, Thomas Pesquet is, is you know, quite big, it's impressive and stuff, but there's a woman that's actually above, and I think that's a hugely positive role model for him. And uh, we've had a question as well from Facebook, uh, from Rhonda on Facebook. Uh, she says that she's heard you've been coaching the actress Eva Green for a fictional role as an astronaut in a film. Did you ever think that your career would take you to Hollywood? <laughs> no, I never did. And also, I was really not sure that my career was going to take me to space eventually. But you know, that's how life is. It's, it's paved with surprises, like we say, at least in French. Um, but, but yeah, I think it's fantastic. Again, it, it just demonstrates uh, the fact that, that space is a field that's not only full of possibilities for people, you know, scientific, technological possibilities, um, endeavors, exploration, it's all hugely positive, but also it appeals to, to people's imagination. They dream about it. There's a hundred stories to be told uh, about space exploration, and, and, and it will go on like this. And as we, as we continue pushing further into space, we'll, we'll write the book of space exploration. It's going to be full of good stories.
So uh, would you have some advice then for anyone who might be watching this and thinking, OK, I'm going to take up that challenge. I'm going to try and become an astronaut. Well, first of all, it's a fantastic decision. That's what I did someday, <laughs> and it turned out pretty well for me. So uh, there are good chances that it might turn out for somebody else. We'll, we'll have new generations of astronauts. We'll keep sending people into space. So I would say today, if you want to become an astronaut, you, you need to have some, uh, some academic, scientific background. Uh, it's a very technological, complex world that we're living in. You have to be able to understand, to inter interact with the machine uh, and all the different systems. So uh, a, good, a good education in terms of science, uh, technology, things like this, or, or medical studies uh, could work as well. Um, you have to be operational in a way, which means uh, to have put yourself um, in some situations where, where you could be harmed. You know, when, when your life was at stake, pretty much. Uh, pilots have done that, obviously. Um, surgeons do this. Uh, people, uh, engineers have been working on oil rigs, uh, or you know, on on, uh, on icebreakers in Antarctica. Scientists do as well. So, mm -hmm. and the, the last advice I want to give to people is try to be international. Where the European Space Agency study foreign languages. You can never know enough foreign languages. Today, um, I'm working with Europeans from all over, uh, Americans, Russians. Tomorrow, we'll work with Chinese people, Indians. So, uh, so that's really a big plus, not only in the field of aerospace, but in every domain. We've just got time for one last little question. Uh, what would be your New Year's wish for 2018? Oh, my New Year's wish for 2018 uh, would be that, that everybody, without exception on the, on the Earth, would take action for um, protecting the environment. Uh, there's, like I said, there's, it's, it's too late to be arguing. The, the proof is here. Uh, it cannot really be disputed anymore, so now is really the time to take action. Thank you so much for speaking to us on, on France 24, Thomas Biscay, and a very happy new year to you. Thank you to you as, well. to you as well. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, happy new year to everybody, and we'll see you very soon for more European interviews here on Talking Europe on France 24.